Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome once again to an evening with the Royal Society of Medicine. What could be better than an hour in conversation with myself and one of our guests tonight? Well, the answer is probably hundreds and hundreds of things. Unfortunately, as we're in lockdown, they're all unavailable. So what else can you do? Sit down, pour yourself a glass of wine, and at least let's see if we can enjoy ourselves for the next 60 minutes. So my guest tonight actually could not be better for that. It is Dr. Richard Horton, who will be familiar to all of you as um, one of the most famous editors, well, of anything actually, but certainly in the world of medicine. Richard is a, an author, a journalist, and a world famous editor of The Lancet, no less. He has won accolades from around the globe, prizes, the Edwin Chadwick Medal, the Edinburgh Medal, I don't know what that is, Hopkins Medal, the Rue Prize, very, very big thing. Innovation in data science, he got for work in maternal health, child health, and planetary health. Planetary health, not a lot left, you might say. All of that we'll talk about and much else. And uh, he's a chair at the London School of Hygiene, etc. But Richard, whatever else happens to you in the world, you will always be associated with that great journal, The Lancet. Uh, founded in 1823, which leads to my first question. What are you planning for your bicentenary in 2023? You must be making plans. What's it going to be? We're starting, Simon. Um, I thought yeah. you were. <laughs> October, October the 5th, 1823 uh, is the anniversary date. Um, and we are beginning to think about what we're going to do. Um, we, haven't, we haven't worked it out fully yet, but it's going to be, we're going to have all year long um, cycle of events. And uh, hopefully we'll be out of lockdown by 2023. So we can actually <laughs> do something. And it, won't, it will not involve Zoom. Oh, thank God for that. If yeah. we never have Zoom again, it won't be a moment too soon. Oh, no. So Richard, you're a doctor, you trained in Birmingham, and uh, indeed you, and you put your first proper jobs, I think, were at the Royal Free. Is that That's correct? Right. That's now, right. I just, I just want to read you your description that you gave at the Royal Free a few years ago. You said, um, the Royal Free was a disaster. Nobody went to work before 11. They all went to the pub at midday, rolled back drunk at three o'clock in the afternoon and left at half past four. And I did think to myself, is this the rest of my life? To be honest, <laughs> it sounds ideal to me, but uh, it obviously wasn't for you. Was it really like that? Well, it was the days after Sheila Sherlock had been um, <laughs> the professor. Yes. And, and of course, this is what happens sometimes to departments which have a famous very powerful figure. Uh, when they go, there's a vacuum. And unfortunately, the 10th floor of the academic department of medicine at the Royal Free at that particular time had something of a vacuum of leadership. And there are a lot of people who um, had legacy positions from when Sheila was um, the professor um, there and um, there was no discipline. And I'm afraid it's true. Um, people turned up in the middle of the morning, went down to South End Green, you know, the pub at the bottom of South End Green. I do, yeah. Opposite uh, the free and um, sank a few pints and rolled back in the middle of the afternoon, not fit to do much else. So I had about, I don't know, almost a year of that and thought this is not the place to be. And you then, again, I believe from a pub, were kind of interviewed by the Lancet in the same, is it the same pub? It must be. No, no, no. no. I, was back oh, up, I was back up in um, uh, Birmingham and oh, okay. uh, I, was, I was having something of a, of a sort of existential life crisis. You know, I was, I'd been massively keen on pursuing a career in academic medicine. Um, I'd just got an MLC training fellowship. Um, I was going to be a lecturer at the Free. Everything was looking good. Um, but I just, I really wasn't sure that this was going to be the thing for me. And then this job, this job advert was put in the Lancet. Uh, and I thought, well, why don't I try it for six months? Um, I, it was, it seemed perfect. I love writing, I love politics, and I loved academic medicine. And so the three things combined seemed like the perfect job. So I, I did, I called up, it was David Sharp, deputy editor from, the, from this pub up in Birmingham and said, look, could I um apply he said yes and then i went there and i haven't left since that was 30 years ago yes i was gonna say it's about time you got a proper job isn't it but, i know uh, well yes. people, now, people now talk about portfolio careers you're supposed to change your job every five years i have singularly failed um to uh pursue a portfolio career no, i think we're both in the same job i've had the same job since 1980 well i've been in the same institutions since 1984 worse well, than you're, my patients more than me, more than me. yes exactly yeah indeed now, I mean, let's be fair, The Lancet has always been one of the world's top journals, one of the, either the number one or the number two scientific journal. 
But the truth was... I've, I've, got, a, I've got a visitor for a second. Oh, oh really? What is it? Hi there. Dog, dog or daughter? Corona. <laughs> His daughter, hello. Because he's talking about corona. My daughter bringing a corona. Very opposite. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent joke. Good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I thought it was going to. I thought you, you did say you might be interrupted by your dog. In fact, <laughs> but anyway, no. Excellent. Um, can you tell her to come to South London because I could do with the same. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Right. Um, now you've completely thrown me, obviously. But I was just about what I was about to say was basically the answer was a thing that you wanted to publish in, but basically not many people would read it. I would read the BNJ, and if you went into a doctor's house. You know, what would you find? Obviously, you'd find Country Life or Horse and Hound if they were surgeons or something, but you'd find the BMJ, yeah. but you wouldn't find the Lancet. I think that's not an unreasonable comment. And now, of course, it's disgustingly readable. So, <laughs> well, take a second to say that. I mean, when I, was a, when I was a medical student in Birmingham, I remember subscribing, obviously, I got the BMJ because I was a member of the BMA, and mm. I started subscribing to the lancet i think when i was a fourth or fifth year medical student yeah so spot. i did i know <laughs> i did i did read it and i think one of, one of the things i found so troubling about it was i didn't understand any of it it was written in the most appalling mm. english i mean and it was it was impenetrable but i think it was partly because it was impenetrable that it had this lingering fascination for me what was this coded language um, that was uh, in this medical journal. And, it, and, and it, as I say, when this job came up, it was like perfect. And I remember, I remember my first day going there. It used to be in this old, um, uh, beautiful office in Bedford Square in London and uh, Bloomsbury. And I remember going in and it was somewhat Dickensian. Uh, the deputy editor, if you had a personal telephone call um, and you're on the phone for more than 10 seconds, he'd start tapping his pencil. <laughs> um, uh, so you had to stop. But although it was it was very old fashioned, I knew from day one that it was home. It'd be fair to say that you were not a blood brother with the editor. I think that's not an unfair comment, is it, Robin? Well, you know, um, Robin appointed me. Yeah. And uh, I greatly admired Robin um, as an editor. He was an editor at the time when the journal was in a bit of trouble. Um, because the previous editor to him, um, somebody called Gordon Reeves, had lasted a very, very short time. And there'd been literally a palace coup. The editors had signed a letter to the publishers saying they would all resign unless they fired the editor in chief. And the publishers didn't do anything. They ignored the staff. And two people then um, resigned. Uh, the upshot was that Gordon Reeves left and Robin Fox stepped in to literally save the journal at probably its most difficult moment in its in its history. Um, and Robin, Robin was great. I think the difficulty was that I came in and I was very, um, I don't know what the right word is. Um, I wanted to see things move, move. I wanted to see things develop. I was very interested in the journal really, you know, having a strong voice in the community and it did um, under Robin, but maybe not as much as, as I would have liked. Anyway, we found a compromise. Um, he basically deported me to open an office in New York. Um, and uh, there I stayed for a couple of years um, out of his hair. And, and so it, it worked out in the end. Um, <laughs> but you're, 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 you're kind of right. It, it was, I, but I do, I mean, I really admired him. I, re I really admired him as an editor. And, and he will go down as somebody who, who did actually save the journal at a moment of crisis. And so you come back and you become the editor, 1995, you weren't 95, you were 33, the youngest in the history of the, uh, the Lancet, and you'll probably no, end up Thomas as- No, Wack Thomas Wackley was 27. Oh, was he? Oh, sorry, yeah. sorry. We'll, we'll bow to the greats of Thomas in a minute. Yeah. I was about to say, you'll probably end up as the oldest as well, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you say you were the youngest. And, uh, but you do start to change the Lancet and you, you change the way it's seen. And um, do you want to just, I, I, there were some kind of pivotal moments for you as, as, the, as the Lancet becomes much broader than it was. And, uh, but this is your story, I'm putting words into your mouth. So what, no, well, what are the kind of key, key phrases for you? I think the, the, the first one was that I read um, Harry Evans' bio, autobiography, Good Times, oh, yeah. Bad Times. And 
I really, really admired Harold Evans as editor of the Sunday Times. I mean, what he 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 brought a campaigning investigative approach to a newspaper that had really hadn't been seen in British journalism in that way before. Um, and although I didn't want the Lancet to be um, in pursuing investigative journalism in quite the same way, I did want it to have a voice in the way the Sunday Times had a voice. And I did want it to um, have a place in culture the way the Sunday Times had, the way Harry Evans had put the Sunday Times mm. in, in the public sphere. So. I, I, I wanted the journal to take risks um, in what it said. I wanted it to hold people with power more accountable. And actually that wasn't my idea. I, re I read a lot about the history of the journal and actually that's what Thomas Wackley did. Um, all we did was reinvent what he did 200 years ago, um, but for a different era. So that was the first thing. But I think after five years, I, I was struggling because, um, you know, the journal, it, we, we would do our peer review, we publish research, the routine things a journal does, but then you could ask the question, well, what are you really there for? Um, and I wasn't actually sure what was the purpose of the journal. And then I got called up by somebody called Eldred Parry, who we just celebrated his 90th birthday a few weeks ago. And Eldred, um, was running a small charity called the Tropical Health and Education Trust. And he, I, I didn't know him at all. Um, and he said, look, um, have you ever been to Africa? And I said, no. And he said, well, you call yourself an international journal, The Lancet, um, and you've never been to Africa. You should be ashamed of yourself. Um, I want you to get your diary out now and I want you to block a week and I'm going to take you to Africa for the first time. So I was, as, as you pointed out, I was in my 30s and he was the senior professor and you did, I did what you always do. I said, OK, prof. And I got my diary out. And then not many months later, he took me to Ethiopia. And then shortly after that, he took me to Ghana. And I think that opened my eyes to a world of medicine that I really hadn't seen before. I'd only trained in Birmingham and uh, in London. Um, and all my electives had been in high income countries. Uh, and I, I could see that there was a medicine out there that the Lancet really was ignoring and we needed to have a global view. Um, and so the task then was to convert the Lancet into a truly global journal. Um, but I still wasn't sure, okay, so that's fine. So we want to be a global journal, but then still, what do you do with it? And then I, it, it was in the early 2000s and this incredible woman called Jennifer Bryce, who was working at UNICEF at the time, um, she too came um, to my office and she said, um, what do you know about child mortality? And again, to my great shame, I didn't know anything about child mortality in 2002, 2003. And she said, well, about 10 or 11 million children under five die every year um, and you don't know anything about it. You should be ashamed. Uh, and so she said that she was going to lead a series for us in which she would bring all the evidence together on child mortality and what can be done to reduce child mortality uh, with a very strong call to action at the end, holding UNICEF and others accountable for not doing anything. Um, so we published that series, I think in 2004, it was our first global health series. And that then taught me a very important lesson. Um, and, and what Jennifer taught me was that you can use science as a platform for political advocacy for social action. Um, and that was a really, that was, a, that was an epiphany. So Eldred opened up the world for us to look at and Jennifer showed me that you can use science in a much more instrumentalist political way. And, and really since then, all we've done is to reproduce those lessons in the series and commissions we do and what we write. Um, but I, owe, I basically owe Jennifer and Eldred everything. I love that story. All you have to do is walk into your office and say, I'm going to publish a series in your journal, Dr. Horton. <laughs> and you do. Um, I would be failing in my duties, the RSM. They would be screaming. I can feel it already if they didn't mention Eldred is, of course, one of our most famous fellows. And indeed, the, 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 the trust he set up lives in the RSM. So again, indeed, um, indeed, we, we, indeed, I would indeed. be in big trouble if I didn't spot that and <laughs> mention it. But I have now mentioned it. So um, you describe that as an epiphany. In, in another interview you gave. And I think yeah. I think that is probably the right word, isn't it? 
Yes, because I suddenly discovered a purpose. I didn't, I didn't know I mean, you, you know, you, you've got your life ahead of you um, in your career and, and you don't quite figure, you know, what are you there to do? Um, and what, what Jennifer showed was that if we judiciously brought the best scientists together with the best evidence, we could construct an argument that would have strong political, a strong political dimension. Um, and that people talk about I mean we've got into trouble for this and we may talk about some of those things <laughs> people people don't like mixing science and politics no but the but the fact is that science is political and medicine is certainly political you know the choices you make in a society about whether you spend money on a health system an education system defense these are political choices so it seems to me crazy to to somehow resist the idea that politics isn't absolutely at the center of medicine and medical science um, so but if if you agree with that then the next step is to say okay well then surely the responsibility of a scientist and certainly the responsibility of a journal is not just to publish the best science and then just leave it on the shelf or leave it on a website and then move on to the next subject your responsibility is to publish that work and then do something with it. I mean, what's the point of spending all this billions, all this billions of money on research if you then don't actually use it and make sure that it gets implemented? So there is an advocacy, a kind of activist role for a journal um, and scientists to try and get the work that they're publishing or producing um, listened to and implemented and acted upon. And that demands a more political approach to science. Okay, now we've, we do have an audience who are asking questions. Um, one is, how do I get Isabel to bring me a beer? That's, uh, <laughs> I think, a perfectly good question. The other is, well, we're gonna do it sooner or later, so let, let's get there sooner. Um, Michael Shepard, uh, a good editor of a, of, a, of a psychiatry journal, who had quite an influence on me, actually. But I remember him once, he said that the job of an editor of a scientific journal, you know, the person whose job is to separate the wheat from the chaff and publish the chaff. <laughs> so let's talk about some of the chaff that you have published. And obviously, yeah. we're going to have to do it sooner or later. Let's get on to MMR. Uh, yeah. Already people are asking about that. Um, I don't really want to go over the... the the story, I, I, because it's so well known, but I want to pick up something you said five years, six years, in fact, afterwards. Um, and again, you, you're a great interviewer, actually, because you give lots of interviews. So there's lots of quotes you've given that uh, are useful. But this was when you, you were talking to the BNJ and you said that you, you by probably like you'd given a scoop to your rivals in the BNJ. And you said that you were incredibly naive. That was the word you use. I don't see you as a naive person. I never have. But um, that, that was your description. How, I mean, you know, you're well, not a naive me, person. Well, let me, I, there is context here. Of course. Um, and let, so let me, I, I, I understand you don't want to go over the story, but there is a little bit of the story. That's yeah, right. no, fine. I don't, I, don't, um, I don't want this to dominate the whole interview. So No, yeah. no, no, yeah. sure. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I worked at the Royal Free. You did? And... I was on the 10th floor in the liver unit. Um, around the corner in the department of, the academic department of gastroenterology was Roy Pounder. Oh yeah. And Roy's um, lecturer, research fellow, whatever he was, was Andrew Wakefield. And Andrew, so I would see Andrew Wakefield in the, um, in the academic department weekly meetings. Um, and he was something of a star in the department. Um, and the reason why he was a star was that he was doing all this work on inflammatory bowel disease. In fact, he, he claimed to discover the origins of inflammatory bowel disease working with Roy. Um, and it was from that work that um, he got interested in the link between viruses and the gut. Um, now, so I, so I could see that he was doing this work at the free. Then I, then I leave the free in 1990 and I go and work, um, start working at the Lancet. Roll on eight years, he's still at the free, still doing his work. Um, I haven't kept in touch with him, uh, but I certainly once knew him. And then he, he submits this paper to us. Um, so I, my frame of reference is thinking of the 10th floor in the free, knowing that he's done this work, knowing that he's seen as something of a, 
um, or, or, you know, he's, he's basically um, rebuilding the reputation of the Department of Medicine at the, at the Free, almost single-handedly, some, some would have said at the time. Uh, and then he sends this paper to us. So my, my approach to the paper wasn't to think that this was a potential piece of fraud. Um, my approach to the paper was to think, well, this is, a, in a sense, a logical follow-on from the work he'd done trying to identify the viral causes of a bowel disease. Because here he was describing a bowel disease linked to um, uh, a, a, what they called a, an integrative disorder, a kind of um, autism, and then with this, uh, what turns out to be completely fallacious um, potential association with a vaccine. But I didn't see it, I didn't see the paper, and indeed the paper very clearly specifies that it didn't prove any association with the vaccine. I didn't see it through the lens of a vaccine. I saw it through the lens of him trying to work out the pathophysiology of bowel disease. Um, that was the naivety, because what, what clearly ended up happening was that he, he was absolutely laser focused on the vaccine. Um, he got this plan to develop his own vaccine. And at the press conference, he wasn't interested at all in talking about the bowel disease. He just wanted to talk about how to um, how, how the triple vaccine was was somehow potentially dangerous. So. I think the naivety that I was identifying there really came from the fact that I, I was looking at his work through completely the wrong frame of reference. That is very much worth, worth saying and interesting. And I also, this is a second time in seven days, I have to declare that I used to know Andrew Wakefield, we used to go skiing together. And he, he mm. yes, he was a guy with a remarkable charisma, a remarkably good skier. Remarkably good drinker and incredibly <laughs> successful with women. I, I was uh, slightly in awe. I, mean, I was genuinely in awe of him, actually. It's yeah. true and very good looking. And, and that's what he was like at the free. I mean, mm. you know, I described how after Sheila left, um, there was this vacuum. And then Andy, and, Andy Wakefield, as we called her, as, when he came in, um, he literally um, lit a blue touch paper and suddenly they were having papers published all over the place. And uh, I remember going to BSG meetings where he'd be presenting this work on the origins of inflammatory bowel disease. I mean, he was, you know, he really made a, an impression. And then, and then for reasons that I honestly, Simon, I still don't understand, it just, the whole thing imploded. And he kind of got this, he got this, I mean, I, I, shouldn't, use, I shouldn't use psychiatric words, but, you know, he got this obsession or delusion over the vaccine and it's dangerous which he's still pursuing and now he's taking it into the COVID-19 era yes um, and I mean it's it's utterly I find it if I think back to those days in the late 80s when he was this young research fellow in this in the department of medicine I just cannot relate the person I remember seeing presenting at meetings then with the person who you see who you see today it's 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 yeah. so yeah. strange I genuinely I do understand that and uh I must admit, I, I lost touch with him like that, and uh, this is not a secret either, that I assumed he would have been an incredibly successful surgeon with a very big private practice. I was very surprised to suddenly see him on the news talking about epidemiology, I must say. Yeah. But it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a kind of Greek, it's a kind of Greek tragedy story, actually. It, it is. Now, two people have said we don't want to spend the whole time on MMR, and quite right, uh, and okay. we don't. So, um, but we will come back to vaccines as well if we have the time. But you know, but but we're in you know we're we're in the we're in the little bit of a of time. This is time for throwing you know uh, pieces of pie at you. Um, so I want to talk about another thing which we, we've said we would talk about, and we would talk, you know we, I asked you about when we were chatting about what was what was your actual worst moment as the, uh, the ed editor of The Lancet, and you didn't say it was MMR, you said it was something else. So yeah. can, can we move forward 10 years to a story which um, some people will be familiar with, but not in the way that everyone is familiar with MMR? Yeah, no, the, the worst thing I think that, I, that anybody can call anybody else, um, at least this is my feeling, um, is anti-Semitic. And we published, uh, um, we published a, a letter, I published a letter, it was my decision to publish the letter, nobody else's, in 2014, which I saw as a cry of anguish from a group of academics, um, 
about the bombing of, Ga of the Gaza Strip by the Israeli Defense Forces. Um, people who know Gaza, it's a very compact area, very high population density. There are very high civilian uh, number of civilian casualties. I've been working in Palestine uh, for um, since the, the, the late um, uh, 2008, 2009. Mm -hmm. I knew people there. I'd been to Gaza. I know people in Gaza. And I was horrified. And when we received this letter, I was angry about what was taking place. Um, and we published the letter pretty much as it was. And then, then the world came down around, not just me, and this is where it was so awful, around my colleagues as well. Um, and, the, and the allegation was that the letter was anti-Semitic. The letter was making statements about Israel that were defamatory. Um, and, and what happened was that um, the diaspora outside of Israel came together very powerfully and boycotted the journal, um, particularly in the diabetes community and cardiologists in North America, um, some in the United Kingdom um, and across Europe. And that, that time to be, uh, and then I was, uh, this bled into uh, my personal life at the time, um, you know, without going into all the details, but uh, the school that my daughter was at, um, you know, there were parents who knew about this uh, controversy and people would say to her, um, you know, why is your dad <laughs> anti-Semitic? I mean, this, it really sort of, you know, it, it sort of bled into all aspects of, of, of life. And that was, I mean, that was just terrible because I'm not anti-Semitic. Um, I don't hate Israel, um, uh, far from it. I've been to Israel as well, as well on many occasions um, and knew uh, Israelis and uh, both Jews and Arabs living in Israel. Um, but I felt very angry about what was taking place during that war. Uh, anyway, to, it, it, it was the worst moment and um, I did think I might be fired for that and I certainly contemplated resigning for that because of the effect it was having on on other dimensions of, of my life um, but um, then the most incredible thing happened this um, nephrologist from Rambam Hospital in Haifa mm -hmm. a man called Karl Skoreski wrote to me um, and at, at that time I think it felt like every doctor in Israel wanted my head um, but Carl wrote to me and he said, look, we haven't met. Uh, I, I'm, you've published this letter, which has caused enormous hurt and harm um, to your journal and to your reputation. Um, but I can't believe that when you published it, that was your intention. Um, I'm imagining that when you published it, you had a very different goal in mind. Um, I'm interested in finding out what that goal was. And I want to invite you to come to Israel, to go to Haifa and to meet with us and to talk it through. Well, I mean, this was unbelievable. Um, and as I found out later, a lot of his friends thought he was crazy because um, he was taking an enormous gamble in inviting me. He had no idea what I was like. Um, and, but I, he was an olive branch. And so I, I took it and I went to Israel and I spent a week with him. And we, we spent, you know, so many hours, um, late hours in the night talking about the history of Israel and the history of Palestine and his history. He took a Leah from Canada. He was from Toronto. Mm -hmm. um, and I met many of his friends. And it was, you know, it wasn't easy. You know, I was really held accountable for what I did. And I apologize for the consequences of publishing the letter um, because those, that wasn't our intention to cause that much upset. It was simply to say what was taking place felt wrong, was wrong. Um, and then we established this friendship and, and we then worked with them to publish a series on, the, on health of Israelis, both Jews and Arabs. And the series, one of the most important messages of the series was the inequalities in health between Jews and Arabs in Israel and what to do about that. Um, and we published that series a few years ago. We launched it in five places across the state of Israel. It was a fantastic experience. We presented it face to face with President Rib Rib Riblin. Um, mm -hmm. it, it, was, it was an amazing moment. So there was a journey. And it was, for me, it was a journey um, 
of ignorance because I started off in a place not knowing as much about Israel as I should have done. Um, and now I, we, we continue to work with our friends in Israel. We continue to have a Lancet Palestinian Health Alliance. We work with them both in parallel. Um, we try, um, it's difficult, but we try and bring the two sides um, together to have constructive discussions. Um, we haven't fully succeeded, but you know, we try every year. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it was, it was that, that was probably from a personal point of view, the most difficult moment, but also because of what happened, um, the most, um, the, you, know, you know, one of the best moments. And in fact, with our friends in Israel, we're going to be launching a commission in the next few weeks on the lessons to be learned from studying the history of medicine and the Holocaust. Ah. Um, so um, we continue. I looked up Carl Skorecki, his, his parents were Holocaust survivors, I think I'm right yeah. in saying, yeah. Well, did that, I, first of all, thanks for saying that. So I did read that you, you did apologize on the Grand Round at Ramban. That must have been, that must have been difficult to do. It was not, not easy to do that. Well, it was, well, maybe it was. I mean, it was, I was, it was telling the truth. Um, True, yeah. I, I mean, when we published the letter, we did not mean to cause, we did not mean to, I certainly didn't mean to send a signal that somehow I was blaming, blaming the entire Jewish population of the world okay. for what, the events of Gaza. And whether the letter said that or didn't say that, uh, it doesn't really matter. The perception was that that's what the letter said. The perception was that the, my decision to publish the letter was an anti-Semitic statement. And, no, it didn't matter how much I tried to say the letter didn't say that. Well, that wasn't going to that wasn't going to deal with it. What needed to happen was some atonement, mm -hmm. and I had to go to. It was right that I went to Israel mm -hmm. and that I stood up in front of everybody and I said I'm sorry, because that's how I felt. I was sorry, um, and I want. Uh, some of my Palestinian friends weren't very happy with me for doing that. Sure. Um, but I think it was the right thing to do. Um, and uh, it led to a collaboration that I think has been very fruitful. I remember having a drink with you around that time of, of the boycott by, uh, I think, mainly cardiologists and nephrologists. And yeah. you were deeply upset. There's no question about that. You were really, you yeah, were I was. weren't in a I good mean, place. Yeah, you were. No, I was not. I was not. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I was not in a good place. No. Uh, it, um, but or not but uh, and it was because you know this this was not the conception of myself that I, no. uh, it was it's such a i mean this is where i think if i when jeremy corbyn was accused of being anti-semitic he played i having been in that situation he could not have played it worse um because in a situation where you you've been accused of being anti-semitic it's pointless trying to argue yourself out of that yeah, yeah. the fact is that is the that is the perception you have conveyed. Whether you meant to convey it or didn't, you've done it. And the only way out of that situation is to accept that you've made a you've made some kind of mistake. Yeah. And you need to apologize for it. And then you demonstrably need to do something to atone for it. Um, and he should have given an unreserved apology. He should have gone to Israel. He should have built bridges, and he didn't do any of those things. And I can I can remember when, when the Labour Party was going through that. It was a car crash, and it was obvious it was going to end badly because they didn't under you see, the the thing. I mean, the, the thing that I learned going to Israel, which I absolutely did not understand and appreciate. Um, and again, you could say this was naive, but I just genuinely didn't understand it. I, I don't think I met a single Jewish Israeli who didn't have some direct familial connection with the Holocaust. And, and unless you, uh, for a non-Jewish person, unless you understand the incredible daily importance of the Holocaust in the life of the Jewish people today, and the, the sense of fragility of their culture, even though they have a state, um, the sense of fragility that it could happen again at any moment. Um, okay. Unless you understand that, you don't get the reason yeah. why they're so sensitive about well, their country. I, no, I, well, I do understand. Um, one, so one last question actually, which I, I would have 
said that we know so much now about, you say, medicine and the Holocaust, so much. There is more to be said? You obviously think there is, because- Yeah, I mean, I do. I, I mean, the, the reason why I think there's more to be said is that, um, I mean, my view is that the, the, the Holocaust should be uh, absolutely part of the standard curriculum for every medical student. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason for that is partly because um, it, it, doctors were actually at the very, very front. It, it wasn't just that doctors were bad. Um, it was actually the doctors led the Holocaust. The origins of the Holocaust lay in Nazi medicine. Mm -hmm. um, it, it began with so-called the so-called euthanasia program for people who had um, uh, diagnoses of, of mental health mm. conditions, but it then it, it then evolved into children, um, in and then into the program for the final solution. But it began with doctors. It was doctors who administered those early programs. It was mm. doctors who administered the genocide. So it wasn't just that there were a few bad people. It was that the, the, the majority of Nazi medicine was at the absolute forefront of, of this program. So that's one reason. The second reason is that the whole basis of research ethics today, so my daily job is all about research ethics. The whole basis of that came out of the doctor's trial at Nuremberg. And yet, who knows that? I mean, a few people that you know it, but I didn't know it until I started reading about it. And most medical students won't know it. And most researchers probably won't know that Nuremberg and the issues of consent and so on came out of, the, came out of that trial. Um, so for just two reasons, um, I, th I think it, we need to take the Holocaust more seriously. And what I've also learned, Simon, is that um, in fact, the Holocaust remains a very, very active area of research study. And even today, new findings are being uncovered about what took place in the Holocaust from a medical point of view. And that scholarship yep. deserves to have a place and deserves to have a platform. So that's what we're hoping to do. We've got about 25 of the world's leading scholars on the Holocaust coming together. We're having our first meeting in February um, and we'll announce it later this month. Oh, fantastic. Can I come, please? <laughs> for the, anyway, for those, <laughs> I'd love to, actually. Uh, and indeed, for those listening, can I also, a, a good, a perfect point, really, in two weeks' time uh, in, uh, in this series, uh, we'll be talking to Anita Lasko-Alfish. Um, again, many of you will be familiar with her. She is, um, unfortunately, will be one of the last surviving uh, uh, survivors of Auschwitz, um, uh, coming up to 100, I think, and uh, who remembers it as, as, a, as a young woman with, with full memories of it, and who played in the, in the Auschwitz orchestra. So that'll be two weeks today. Um, I wasn't going to plug that one, but how can I not now that, <laughs> now that you've just said Good. that? Good. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, get once again, we're not going to get through all the questions that we want to get through. But I want to, let, let's go back a little bit to, to and uh, quite a lot of people are interested in this issue of medicine and politics. And um, there's no question uh, at all that, that you've, uh, you, you've pushed um, the Lancet into, you, and you've explained why. And if, if I can just quote from you, rather than asking you to do it, exactly when you got the Rue Prize, um, which is a very distinguished thing, this is what you said. You said that we believe the purpose of creating knowledge isn't just publication, but to use that knowledge to accelerate social progress and to hold those in power accountable for their promises and commitments. Now that's a bit more than saying our research should have impact, isn't it? Because we all believe yeah. our research should have impact. You're taking it to a higher level. And I think it's true to say that not everybody agrees with you and I'm not gonna be the first person who's asked you that question. No, I, that's perfectly, perfectly right. But science is all about delivering, hopefully, um, the most reliable knowledge that we have. And that reliable knowledge should be used as a means to hold those with political power accountable. Now, I, these, again, these ideas um, are not mine. They actually come from um, core principles in human rights. Accountability um, is is composed of, th of three elements. First of all, monitoring. Um, so you need reliable information so that you can be sure about, about what's taking place. Secondly, a method for democratic partic participatory discussion around what those data mean. 
Um, and thirdly, doing something about it. So it's monitor, review, and act. Now the monitoring bit, that's where science comes in. Science is monitoring the progress in the health of communities and nations, providing robust evidence about health. Then a journal provides a place where you can have that democratic participatory discussion. And then the third part, which is doing something about it, that's the political part, but it can't happen without having the monitoring and the review. So we're involved in the first two, and then what we're then doing is saying, okay, politicians and policy makers, this is what the evidence says, this is what we think you should do with the evidence, and now we're going to say to you, what are you going to do? And if you don't do it, then you're not following the evidence. And we've heard that, we've heard that phrase rather a lot in the last year. Um, but a, a, a journal, it seems to me, is about connecting the scientific community um, and their generation of evidence with the policy and political community that should do something about it. And we're, in a sense, providing the connection between those two. Thank you very much. You probably noticed going on behind me. My own version of Isabel is about to give me a top up of wine. <laughs> but yeah, but, yeah. but, but I, I th you made that point well. But of course, it also does lead you into difficult areas, um, not least because The Lancet is a, a capitalist enterprise. You're owned by Elsevier, not known for its, um, how shall I put it, philanthropic activities, not really. Um, this must surely have brought you not into conflict with the public, or that people you have it has as well. I don't think that bothers you, but with your with your masters, surely there must have been times when uh, you've yeah again you've been in a bit of trouble. I mean, no, not, no, that, definitely. Um, I mean, big companies, big big organisations are complicated or complicated. Yeah. Um, there are good parts and there are less good parts, and there are sometimes good leaders and less good leaders. Um, now, I've been in Elsevier a long time, and there have been less good leaders in the past um, who've been more concerned with making money than with the science that they publish. Um, now, it so happens that we're currently um, under new management, and uh, the first woman to be appointed chief executive of Elsevier came into her position a couple of years ago, her name's Kunsel oh. Bezik, um, and she is a different kind of leader. Uh, she came in and she was horrified by the reputation that Elsevier had, which was, as you point out, not very <laughs> yes. good. Um, and she, she's made it one of her priorities to change the reputation, to, to, to basically build the reputation of Elsevier, to make it trusted by the scientific community, and very much to do the sorts of things that I've been talking about, make, make publishing actually a servant of society, not something that takes from society, but that gives back to society. Um, and that, at its best, is what journals should be doing, providing a conduit between, for knowledge, to make the biggest image. In fact, I mean, this is, Simon, this is just the, the, the um, this was the origin of the Enlightenment. If you go back and you read the introduction to Diderot's Encyclopedia um, by Dollenberg, that introduction is all about the, the purpose of producing an encyclopedia wasn't just to produce, I like your dogs barking. Yes, um, uh, yeah, you the, can hear it the, too, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the purpose of producing the encyclopedia um, for the Enlightenment wasn't just to produce knowledge, it was to put knowledge to a, for a purpose, for, for social action. It's in, the, it's in the introduction to Diderot's encyclopedia. And all scientific journals since then, you know, the, the whole basis of philosophical transactions in 1665 was that same idea, science for a social purpose. I think somehow along the way in the 20th century, we might have forgotten that. And now what we're trying to do is to reinvent that. Brilliant exposition, Richard. <laughs> Never had you down as a student of Diderot, but actually in retrospect, I probably did. But, okay. So, but let's, uh, the question I was going to ask you but is, Okay, now you, you have a, a new leader now, a new chief exec, but you didn't for 28 years. You no. must have, have you ever been close? Have you ever thought you were going to be fired? Yeah, yeah, under the previous one. Um, <laughs> I, uh, the, the Gaza letter was a tricky moment. Then there was another one. Um, we, and this was pure accident, actually. Um, we've been following AstraZeneca's in the news a lot these days, but in a different incarnation, um, again, with a different chief executive. AstraZeneca was involved in some, what I thought was some very shady marketing practices for one of its uh, calcium channel blockers, I think it was. And um, we've been 
following this. And we wrote, we wrote this editorial, which was taking AstraZeneca to task and calling it a, appallingly unethical company. Anyway, most of the time, nobody would have paid the blind bit of attention to that. But what we hadn't realized was that the day the editorial came out was also the day of the annual earnings report for the company, <laughs> the for the city. And so it looked as if we deliberately timed the editorial to come out with their city report. And of course, their shares, which should have shot up, actually shot down. Um, and the chief executive of AstraZeneca rang the chief executive of Reed Elsevier, as, as, as it's called then, demanding that I be fired instantly. Uh, it's the only time I ever got to talk to the chief executive of Reed Elsevier. He would never have deigned to talk to somebody as lowly as me. But he did, call me up at, <laughs> <laughs> he did call me up and ask what the hell I, he thought, I thought I was doing. Mm. Um, but I, fortunately, or, or not, um, we moved on. <laughs> Well, mention of AstraZeneca takes us right to the present, and as you say, seen in a different light now. Um, so let, let's let's finish with a little bit of COVID. Uh, Jeremy Lawrence says about you that you, you, you're not frightened of making enemies, and I think that's clearly the case. You're not. Um, and in the current situation, you, you've managed that as well. You made friends and you met enemy, enemies. You've also written a book, and um, I have it here, the COVID oh, catastrophe, yeah. of course. And and it's, you know, you're, you're giving us of your time. The least we can do is plug your book. I believe there's a new edition. Come, have you got a new edition coming out? Did I? Yeah, I, I spent the Christmas holidays doubling the length and updating it with vaccines and variants. And the sec and the second edition is coming out at the end of this month. Don't double the length because it is mercifully short, actually. Yeah, is, yeah. Sorry about that. yeah, okay. But okay, now then, you know, COVID, uh, we're not gonna do that in, in 10 minutes at all, but 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 I, I want to start off with with um still really linking with what we've just been saying. And this is you again, this is you talking to the New Yorker earlier this year. And, and and it's I just want because it, it does fit in with with the narrative you're describing. Now this is you telling the New Yorker you say but one part of the story we're trying to deal with is in an objective way as possible, make judgments about the science, following the science, okay. But at the same time, we're constantly trying to assess and arrive at preliminary conclusions. And you say and about the political result, you say that is obviously not objective. It is clearly political. But then you say a new thing and requires a subjective and often deeply emotional response. And I've not heard you talk about an emotional response before. So tell me, and obviously, you know, I'm a shrink. We, are, we do these yeah. kind of things, but, <laughs> but why, why have you now added a new dimension to your politics, which is that of emotion? Well, I think the, um, I, I'll tell you the reason why, um, briefly. In, in the last week of January, Simon, we published five papers, which, if you go back and read those papers, especially the discussion sections of those papers, they basically tell the whole story of the past year, um, which we all know. Um, new virus, new disease, filling ITUs, no treatment, no vaccine at that time, um, cytokine storm, uh, not a typical pneumonia, multi-organ failure, need PPE, need, need test trace isolate systems, it's gonna be a global pandemic. All of that was known in January. It's all there in black and white, not hindsight. I'm not making it up. It's all there by January the 31st. Um, and so, and then we did nothing in February and early March. Um, even at the beginning of March, Neil Ferguson had presented data by March the 3rd, 4th or 5th to government ministers showing that the doubling time was every three days or so and that we we're about to face a crisis. It still took till March the 23rd before we had the lockdown. So yeah, I was emotional and I remain, I don't know whether emotional is the right word, but I remain incredibly angry about the fact that we wasted six weeks when we knew exactly what was going to happen, what was coming at us. And and, I, and I'm sorry to say, our scientific and medical advisors and our politicians um, did not do enough. And, and it's not, and, and it, you know, people will say, well, this is self-righteous hindsight. And I will say, no, it's not. Go and read those five papers in the last week of January, from January the 24th through to January the 31st. It's all described there. There is no excuse. So we should be angry about that. We should be shocked about our failure. And then okay. we got it, and then we got it under control in in August, and now we've 
we've gone and not learned the lessons of that time and we're repeating those those failures yet again i mean who shouldn't be emotional about it i mean this is what what are we what are we up to now we had 1500 deaths today um, we're over, uh, I think, one way of counting the figures, we're up to 100,000 deaths nationwide. I mean, we should be emotional about this. In fact, my, my worries, my worry, Simon, is that we're not emotional enough about this. We're not angry enough about this, but we're somehow letting the government off. We're saying, well, it's a new virus. How could they possibly have known? Um, you know, this was a totally unexpected random event. Um, everybody's struggled. We're not, we haven't done worse than anybody else. I'm sorry, that is not acceptable. Uh, the, government, okay. the, government, the government has a duty of care to its public. And the fact is the government did not discharge its duty of care to its public. OK, and in your book, you, you talk about the fact that WHO declared, uh, I've forgotten what the uh, phrase public is. Public health emergency of international concern. Yeah, but I, I, would, I would remind you of just one thing, which I, I think you've been a little unfair, which, of course, the last time they did that was for the swine flu epidemic. And of course, that didn't really amount to very much. And, and I know that- Simon, um, Simon, 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 come on. Look, read those papers. You, you know China, and certainly our, our, our scientific advisors know China. China being a centralized authoritarian state, medicine is run in the hands of a few people. Mm -hmm. what, what happened in those early days in January? We, we heard about the fact that there was some atypical pneumonia. We got in touch with Wang Chen, president of the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences, mm -hmm. Chen Zhu, former minister of health, uh, and George Gao, who is, leads the China CDC. And we said, what the hell is going on? Um, and they said, well, we think something bad's going on. So we said, well, look, um, I appreciate you're managing something bad, but could, would you like to write up a series of papers and publish them in The Lancet so you can tell the world about this? Um, now, China has been very much criticized for, its, for how it's handled this, but I can tell you that those three individuals mobilized their teams in Wuhan and Beijing, wrote those five papers, and also George um, Lung in, um, in Hong Kong, wrote those five papers, which told the whole story. So why didn't our, go why didn't our embassy in Beijing do the same? Why didn't they go and say, what the hell is going on in Wuhan? And then send a message back to 10 Downing Street or FCO or the chief medical officer, the chief scientific advisor, and say, my God, there is, there is a, a, you know, a tumultuous meltdown taking place in Wuhan. We need to get ready for it. George, George Lung was, wrote in, in The Lancet on January the 31st that a global pandemic was coming, and he had a map of Wuhan, and he had a table showing how the flights out of Wuhan were seeding the virus not just in Asia, but across the world. I mean, we, we need to remember this. I mean, the history needs to be told, not forgotten. No, I'm not, I'm not denying that at all. I'm, I'm just saying that I think you, there's a little bit of hindsight there, isn't there? Even if it's only in those couple of weeks. We, I don't we agree. I don't, know, I don't, don't, don't read the papers. <laughs> I, I did, actually. I, did, I didn't at the time. That, I, that's not hindsight. Yeah, OK, OK. Um, uh, and, and I just have to just remind you also, you did, you did also in your first book, uh, 2004, you did say that, that WHO was a particularly, I think you call them fairly useless and very cowardly organization. Um, that was some of your view. <laughs> and that's, and that, is, that is true. But it's when the true. International Health Regulations Emergency Committee at their second meeting in January declared that there was enough evidence for a public health emergency and Tedros immediately accepted that and issued that public health emergency on January the 30th. That is the most, again, the most powerful um, evidence. Uh, it, it, it is the greatest power that a director general of WHO has to send a signal to the world about the danger that it faces. He sent that signal and nobody paid any attention. How, did, how can that happen? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, you, you, I, 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 I see what you're saying, and I do agree. I still suspect there, there are more nuances. I don't think it's quite that. Uh, you, but your, your, your anger and, and, and emotion is very compelling, and I look forward to the next edition, uh, <laughs> which will update it. Um, now then, just before we finish, I want to two things. One is to put you one question that, that um, uh, is that we've talked about the things that you wished you hadn't published. Leslie Fallowfield asked, what about the things that you did
didn't publish that wish that you had? And she says, I mean my papers. But apart from <laughs> her papers, what's, what's, um, you, must, you must have rejected something, seen it appear in a competitor and think, bloody hell, how, how did we miss that one? Yes, that's absolutely true. Um, I, the one that I remember that we rejected, uh, which I wish we published, was actually the paper by Atul Gawande about checklists ah. um, in surgery. And, and we had that paper, it was published in the New England Journal eventually, we had that paper and, and I think everybody around the table thought that it was so, it was so deceptively simple um, how to improve surgical outcomes with a checklist that it was just too simple. And how could The Lancet publish just recommending that you should have a checklist for surgery? Um, and so we kind of, we ended up having, you know, getting far too um, pretentious about it all. We rejected it. It appeared in the New England Journal and it's an absolutely fantastic paper. And that's all wrote a wonderful book about checklists. Um, and that was, that was one we should never have let go. Sometimes you can be too clever. And I think that was a moment when we were, we were too clever by half. Okay. And well, now, papers, of course. Sorry, of course, that. yes, that takes and mine. <laughs> but OK, have, have we ever rejected one of yours? I yeah, yeah, I've actually passed it. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but you'd be very good. And I, yeah. and I must say that when you have to go to present to you lot, when you're on the edge of rejecting it, the same as trial by Lancer, it's about one of the best <laughs> things one ever does. And to have all your editors there, it's both funny, it's terrifying, it's exciting, it's intellectually stimulating, it's just brilliant. Now then. We started with you among the drunks of the Royal Free. We went back to the Royal Free when you to meet up with Andrew Wakefield of uh, Complex Memories. But yeah. let's finish. You found yourself back in the Royal Free again two years ago. <laughs> yes. I think it's fair. You saw a very different side of it. Let's finish with that. You, it is public knowledge, and we agreed we would uh, finish that a little bit. You as a person. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, um, it's very strange. Uh, the Royal Free has been at the centre of my life for far too long. Um, in February or March of 2019, uh, I went in under the knife of the magnificent Peter Butler, who essentially opened up my entire head from here down to here and back here and ripped out every lymph node uh, he could find plus a good chunk of my parotid and submandibular gland um, in order to try and uh, defeat stage 3C melanoma. Uh, and uh, I'm extremely grateful to him and the Royal Free team for what they did. Um, it wasn't the finest moment of, of, of a life. Um, and I walked around in a hoodie for months afterwards, only ever going out in the dead of night um, because I didn't want anybody to see what a wreck my head was. Um, but um, thanks to them, and uh, I had a couple of recurrences, um, and then I had a year of immunotherapy um, and stopped taking my immunotherapy in September. And here I am, and um, fingers crossed, toes crossed, touch wood. Um, uh, I've got a, a new dawning. Um, so I feel great, and uh, I love the Royal Free. Um, and uh, I go back every six months for a couple of scans. I just went for my latest PET CT last week, um, and uh, and so there we are. Yeah, it's but it was it, and to do do it all during COVID nineteen was very strange. Um, but I have, as 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 um, as anybody will say, nothing but admiration for the NHS and what they what they're able to do under under lockdown. I mean, you know, I was here as a whatever they call it, extremely vulnerable, shielded person. And I needed to get my drugs, my medicines. Um, and, I, you know, the doorbell would go and the courier would be there and bringing my medicines around. I mean, what other health system could do that? You know, it was absolutely, uh, you know, and I didn't have COVID. Um, so I know that, I know that it, it's been difficult for the NHS, but my God, they just did the most amazing job and are continuing to do the most amazing job. That's fabulous. I, yeah, honestly, I, I feel almost emotional now. And said we shouldn't bring emotion to these, but I do. <laughs> um, and I don't think Lance ever did that. The BMJ went through a period of publishing personal view. Every time a doctor got ill, they used to write a personal view of it. Do you remember all that? But yeah. Any... No, I don't want to do that. You don't um, want to do that. Excellent. <laughs> I, I don't want to, you know, if I've got limited, if I've got limited time, I want to spend my time doing things that are not about me, but are about COVID and. Um, or whatever the issue is. And, um, you know, it doesn't matter 
you know, my experience is the same as an experience. I mean, I used to go to the melanoma clinic. clinic. It was full of people. Um, my experience is no different to anybody else's. It's irrelevant. It's, it's an event. It happened. Move on um, and, okay. uh, and do whatever. OK, now don't go. I need to a couple okay. of winding up things and then I'll return to you. Just to, uh, to remind everyone that uh, tomorrow in our lunchtime series, what could be more topical? Professor Sharon Peacock uh, for the Genomics Consortium will be talking, uh, interviewed by Andrew Jack of the FT, and be talking about mutations in the COVID virus. So what more could we do? Next week, it'll be our old friend and all around Mr. Lovable, the great Sir Don uh, Buick, Berwick, sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll be talking on our COVID series a week on Thursday about the pandemic in America and answering Don Goldenberg's question, and I think he's the Don Goldenberg of rheumatology and fibromyalgia, who's the Americans asked us, why are we doing this on January the 21st? It will be 24 hours after the inauguration of Joe Biden, whose health plan Don helped write. So Don, come back to that. And uh, you'll be able to ask directly Don, um, hey, you both called Don, that's a coincidence, um, about uh, uh, Biden and his health plans. This time next week, Roger will be back talking to Sir Andrew Dilnot uh, on this conversation series. This is the man with the plan to fund social care, except it was never implemented. So a lot to talk about there. Now, I do ask you once again to support us uh, because this is how we bring you such brilliant people as Richard Horton and, and, and all the other people who've taken part in this series. And uh, the best way to do that is to support us and indeed join the RSM people. Our membership is going up again. People are now once again thinking there is a future uh, and uh, what better way to do uh, uh, than join the RSM and keep up the good work. Right, back to you, Richard. I had not worked out how to, to finish this off, but as you were talking, I think I finally got you cracked and I want to go back to that epiphany in Ethiopia oh, and back God. to 1823 and Wackley, who, by the way, he went to jail, didn't he? That's the only thing you haven't he done, did. I think. Yes. <laughs> so well, that's one more thing for your bucket list, you know, get to jail. Anyway. Yeah. So, and you've already done it because you, you brought this up, actually. You said 1823 is, is your time as well, a, a time which the Enlightenment values have real influence. And you have just said you are a perfect Enlightenment period who believes in the potential of science, etc. But it's also the triumph of the romantic imagination, which exactly. you've not mentioned, but it is. No, exactly. And that's what you are, Richard. You're a product yeah. of the Enlightenment and a product of the romantic imagination. Well. So you're a, a romantic visionary despite yourself. Um, you go back to Lancer in 1823 and you go forward to it in 2023. What, what a person, what a story. <laughs> it's just been fantastic to talk to you. I knew it would thank be. You. And uh, thank you for doing this. And uh, Thank you very much, Simon. It's oh, a pleasure no, thank to you. talk to with you. Okay. And love to okay. Isabel. And um, I'm going to have my drink now, and you, you should too. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. You take okay. care. You and too. Hi to Claire, everybody. Bye-bye. Well, will do. Bye-bye. Good night, all. Good thank night, you. all. Good night.